Chen, uh, Dimitri Anil for the invitation. I'm very excited to be here. And so I work uh, in a quantitative research at Societe Generale. Um, and so today I'm going to talk about the volatility premium uh, and its relationship with option performance. Uh, so the presentation is really split into two parts. Um, one part is uh, basically ends up with trying to find an equation uh, that tries and decompose the PNL of uh, delta hedge option. And the second part is uh, you know, about injecting some actual real numbers into that equation. So um, you know, if at any point, I mean, I'm going to go kind of into a fairly detailed uh, level presentation of the equation. So if at any point you kind of, you know, I've lost you, um, well, it's not really a big deal because I, I um, uh, we can move on to the next part after that about uh, kind of studying the uh, empirical properties of that equation. So um, with that uh, being said, um, um, I'll start with a um, fairly uh, innocuous, hopefully, uh, definition, uh, um, the definition of the volatility premium. Uh, and I'll start with that because I'm going to be using that word you know, uh, four times every sentence. So might as well uh, agree on what it means. Um, uh, so volatility premium uh, for most practitioners or for most people in banks is the difference between the applied vol uh, now and the uh, subsequent realized uh, vol. Uh, um, and uh, so you know, in, implicit in that definition is a tenor, right? To define the time window after today, uh, implicit um, as I well. I got a clarifying question. So yeah. the, the realized vol will in general be random. So do you really mean that the volatility premium at T is random? Uh, yeah, uh, or no, I mean, it's not exposed. You know, I should define it as like, you know, something that you know at uppercase T. Yeah, so you mean the, I think you mean the expectation of the realized vol over little t, little t plus capital T, no? Uh, um, no, I think I mean it as the, vol the, the kind of exposed. Uh, so volatility premium is really a function of time uppercase T. It's okay, a realized so quantity. Say, we'll know this number for the first time at capital T. Is that right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. OK. OK, that's fine. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, OK, so that's the only definition in the presentation. Uh, I'll say a few words about motivations uh, from a kind of, you know, from our perspective. You know, I, I know those motivations can not always uh, overlap with uh, academia, but I thought I would just leave them as is. Um, uh, just you know, to give you a perspective of the kind of thing that we uh, kind of come across. Uh, one motivation is um, there's this idea, and you know we'll discuss it later. But there's this idea that uh, if you delta hedge an option, your performance is linked to the um, to the so-called vol premium that we just discussed, right? So the, there's this idea that that the volatility premium, i.e., loosely speaking, the difference between implied and realized volatility, is one of the main drivers of performance when you uh, you know, on a delta hedge uh, option. Uh, and so if that's the case, uh, is there an actual kind of, you know, kind of beta or delta between the two quantities? You know, in other words, if I know that uh, vol premium is going to be 1% in the next year, um, in what size should I buy or sell an option to make a given amount of uh, PNL, you know, say 1 million, for example. So there's this idea among practitioners of a relationship between your PNL and the actual uh, volatility premium, but there's no actual kind of way to move from one to the other. So trade sizing was one of the things that kind of got us uh, sort of to work on this. Another one is one day we were doing a bunch of back tests of you know short straddle strategies, uh, and you know that kind of confirms that yes, there's some sort of you know optical link between or some sort of monotonicity between the volatility premium and the performance of delta hedge uh, options. Uh, but sometimes that you know, completely breaks. So for example, uh, the example I have here is um, one year Australian dollar um, versus dollar straddles. So I mean, foreign exchange here, if you uh, were to sell those straddles uh, over the past 13 years repeatedly, so you sell your delta hedge all to maturity, you sell again, et cetera, et cetera. If you do that over the past 13 years, you would have actually made a significant amount of money, even though implied trades below realized. So, you know, kind of a counter example to that notion that you, know, you make money from implied being above realized here, it just goes the other way. 
and so we didn't know why. Um, another motivation is uh, we kind of wondered at some point whether the path taken by implied volatility uh, when you hold an antihedron option to maturity whether the moves in implied vol actually uh, impacted the kind of terminal PNL or whether it was just kind of noise. Uh, we had no kind of, we felt like we lacked the tool to actually like you know, provide some sort of answer or even kind of like contextualize the, the question. Um, I should have, there's another motivation which I could have put here is the concept of carry. Um, so there's a large uh, business uh, which involves uh, quantitative like strategies aiming to harvest so-called uh, carry uh, in volatility space, typically by going long uh, an option in some shape or form. Uh, and so it's kind of, you know, if we're going to, you know, I mean, it's kind of useful for that business to be able to actually quantify the carry that those strategies deliver to a customer. And when you think about it, what is the carry for an option? Well, the carry is the, generally speaking, the carry is the money that you make or lose as time passes and market variables don't change. So for a bond, that's pretty easy to define. Um, for an option though, it's kind of not necessarily like straightforward when you think about it, you know, like what is market, how do you define market doesn't move for an option? Is it like spoke doesn't move, but then realize goes to zero and then it's more like a tail scenario, et cetera. So anyway, just even like getting our heads on, you know, what carry means for an option is another motivation that got us started. Uh, so there's a, an abundance of, uh, you know, interesting and kind of insightful literature on the volatility uh, premium um, over the past uh, 20 years. Um, so Peter Carr and Yuren Ru have been especially active on the topic. I'm only like quoting here a few a few papers. Um, in 2009, they uh, looked at, uh, I believe, equity uh, variance swaps and showed that the volatility premium uh, had a positive bias in that market. Um, um, uh, in 2015, they, they kind of introduced a, a model that uh, matched the implied volatility surface and as well was able to embed a non-zero uh, volatility uh, premium. So, uh, I mean, you're, you're the experts on, on the, the literature, um, I'm obviously probably making some kind of shortcuts here, but bottom line is that there's been a, a lot of investigation in the topic of volatility premium. Uh, in recent years, we're seeing, or I saw a lot of uh, kind of machine learning type uh, empirical uh, analysis of that quantity uh, as well. So I quote one article here. Um, there's also a fair amount of uh, uh, there's a fair amount of uh, literature uh, on, on the banking side, a fair amount. I mean, there's some amount of literature. There's a book in particular, um, uh, I think from, from some colleagues from a, a competitor um, uh, from six years ago that looks at especially like the FX option performance um, and tries to understand the performance driver. Uh, and so in, in this literature, um, we um, didn't necessarily find like the, you know, answers to the questions uh, or, or the full answers to the questions that we had earlier or to all the questions. So that's what, that's what kind of got us um, you know, working a little bit um, on that topic. Um, and, and you know, trying to see if there was something there that could remain to be found. Um, and so now I'm gonna enter the kind of meat of the presentation to the you know, proof of the formula. And then I will um, uh, kind of you know, inject some kind of real numbers into it. Uh, so what we're going to do is going to come up with a formula for the PNL of a delta hedge option, uh, which in particular links the volatility premium to the PNL uh, volatility premium as I defined earlier. Uh, and so the starting point for that formula is the kind of, inf you know, the kind of infinitesimal uh, accounting equation for uh, an option. So I have it here. PNL is so I'm considering here a delta hedge vanilla option with price p. I make no assumption on the dynamic of the price. Um, and so I'm just going to look at the PNL of that option delta hedge. So the, if the option is delta hedge, the PNL is uh, the price differential for the option minus delta times price differential for the underlying. Um, and so when volatility is constant, this reduces to that second equation here. So PNL now is. You know, that's kind of like the black Scholes framework. A PNL now becomes really gamma, roughly, times uh, the quadratic variation of S minus uh, 
you know, implied vol to the square times s square times dt. So it's yeah, really sorry to interrupt, but, uh, yeah, of course. You said there was no assumptions on dynamics, but you're actually assuming continuity here of the sample path. Ah, uh, good point. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, um, uh, yeah. So otherwise, if if it's a jump process, there's some, some other term jumps in the appears from the generator, indeed. Um, 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 but so so like here, I'm just you know I'm just kind of pointing out what this reduces to under black shore. Um, and uh, so yeah, so in with black shore things are quite easy. Your PNL over a small amount of time is just gamma times, you know, what really is quadratic variance minus sigma square s square dt. Uh, and um, that's the reason we think why you know, especially among bank practitioners, this this idea volatility premium drives your PNL, and it's because you know this kind of differential here. You know, feels a bit like uh, the volatility premium, right? It's like instead of vol, you have variance, but it's a bit uh, what it feels like. And so that, in our opinion, is what kind of contributed to um, uh, leaving that kind of mark in people's kind of uh, psyche or kind of intuition. So um, so that's under Black Shoal. Everything is all nice and well. And so there's a kind of a pretty uh, simple relationship. Uh, and so what we do in the paper is we're going to try to lift the black shoal uh, restriction, i.e. to let uh, sigma be arbitrary, no longer constant. And we're going to integrate the equation. We're no longer going to look at it over a, an infinitesimal amount of time. We're going to look at it over an arbitrary period from inception to any time uh, lowercase uh, t. So, um, first, let's waive the black shoal restriction. Now, sigma is no longer constant, it moves. And so that brings two terms into the equation, uh, a Volga term here and a Vana term here, right? So I'm just, you know, I just started from here and I just, uh, I'm adding and a Vega term. So I'm adding like three you know, partial derivatives uh, from uh, sigma being uh, non-constant. And so what can we do from here? Um, well, let's just start with focusing on the, the first two terms here. Um, so gamma and uh, the, the idea here, I mean, our kind of, just to give you an intuition, our idea is that there's a bit of a transfer that occurs here when you uh, think about it, because if you're selling an option, implied vol spikes, you lose money from implied from this term, right? Because you're short an option. Implied vol spikes, you lose mark to market instantaneously. But then here, the bar to clear from this gamma term, you know, subsequently is much higher because now to uh, lose money, you need to realize above implied and implied is now higher. So there's a bit of a kind of entanglement or transfer between those two PNL terms. And we kind of, our kind of idea was to try and disentangle those two parts from this perspective. Um, and so, so the way we do this is so we focus on this term. We notice that gamma and vega are linked. Um, um, so p here uh, is the um, so, so this, this formula is true under um, p is the black shoal price of the option here. Sigma is arbitrary, so that means you know we don't follow black shoal dynamics. But however, sigma is the black shoal implied volatility, and so that means that this relationship will hold. Um, in our uh, kind of formula, right? So, so again, there's no black shoal assumption, but P is the you know sigma. Well, it's basically a quotation choice. Sigma is the black shoal implied vol of the uh, of the, of the option, and as a result, this formula holds. I.e., Vega is the dollar gamma times sigma times time to uh, maturity, uh, and so um, if this uh, relationship holds, then I just replace Vega by you know, this new quantity here, dollar gamma times, et cetera. Um, so when I do that, uh, now I'm just going to work a little bit on this term here um, from Ito. We know that D sigma square is two D sigma D sigma times D quadrative relation of sigma. And so I'm going to use that to replace sigma D sigma here by you know, sigma square and D quadrative relation of sigma. So uh, this term becomes um, this term here. Right. Um, and so now I'm going to inject, you know, sigma zero, i.e. sigma at trade date, 
the implied volat trade and into the equation. Uh, and so I'm going to take some notations. Uh, gamma dollar is just the dollar gamma. Uh, and then sigma zero is implied vol at t equals zero. So that's the implied vol that we traded uh, uh, when we uh, transacted, we got into that position. And so when we um, do this, so here, the different the step between here and here is that I replace sigma square by, you know, I do minus sigma zero square plus sigma zero square. So most of these steps are pretty small. Uh, there's not a lot of kind of that goes on. So here I just do artificially, I do minus sigma zero plus sigma zero to make sigma zero appear. Um, and then uh, once uh, I've uh, done that, I'm just gonna break these parentheses into its constituents. So D sigma square minus determine uh, quadratic relation of sigma. Um, and, uh, and then this one plus this one is equal to this one. Um, and, uh, and getting to the last line is just a matter of uh, notation. Uh, so the difference between this equality and this equality is um, you know, differentiating a product. So if you differentiate this product here, you end up with this term plus this term. And then here I just kind of rearrange everything and just put dollar gamma uh, multiplicatively uh, uh, in front of every every member. Um, right. So not. I mean. So so this is uh, what we do. And so now that gamma plus vega PNL is equal to this quantity. Um, and uh, kind of the next step uh, is going to be to uh, basically do something that looks like an integration by part. So. You can see here, I have like something that looks like U dV, right? U dV. U dV is duV minus V du minus D quadratic relation of UV. Uh, and so I'm just going to replace, you know, this U dV by uh, the three uh, quantities here. So that's what I do here. So again, I'm just like rewriting the same equation here just for, uh, is of uh, make it a bit easier to follow. Uh, so this is where we stand uh, right now. And so again, we're going to use the fact that Vega equals dollar gamma times sigma times time to maturity uh, to um, rewrite this quantity here. Uh, so I'm just saying, and you know, just rewriting it like more explicitly. Uh, dollar gamma. Uh, did I miss? Uh, Oh, yeah, sorry, I just, I just forgot to mention here that I take a notation gamma star is um, the discounted, um, this is missing a dollar here, discounted dollar gamma. So instead of I've kind of like a bit sneakily replace gamma, um, dollar gamma by gamma star, uh, gamma star is just uh, discounted dollar gamma. Um, so from, so this is where we stand right now. Uh, Vega is equal to the dollar gamma times sigma times time to maturity. Uh, and um, and yeah, we can rewrite this block. Uh, so I just rewrite it more explicitly here. So gamma gamma star again is discounted dollar gamma. Uh, everything else is unchanged. Uh, I'm just going to multiply by sigma divided by sigma here. Uh, the next line I write a square minus b square at, as a plus b a minus b. Um, and then uh, finally, I'm going to use that equality here to replace that dollar gamma by a vega. And so uh, I, I'm left with this. And so uh, if we re-inject this back here, I end up with this formula here. Um, and, um, and so if I you know, plug this back into the bigger equation, remember here, we're just focusing on the gamma plus vega term of the Kind of infinitesimal PNL. If I plug it back into the, I know I'm not done yet. Sorry. So yeah. So um, so this is where we stand. For this for kind of, uh, thing. So this is where we stand right now. Um, so PNL uh, gamma plus vega is a gamma term, uh, something that has a vega in it, and then some other terms. Uh, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to focus on um, the gamma term uh, here. Uh, and I'm going to try to make the volatility premium appear um, in this quantity. Uh, so what's the intuition here? Well, the intuition is that if your gamma star is constant along the way, 
um, it's pretty easy to have the volatility premium appear because uh, you're going to have like variance square, realized variance square minus implied vol square. And so A square minus B square is A minus B, A plus B. So uh, just, when gamma star is uh, constant, this is very easy. Uh, so the idea is to write this as what it would be if gamma star were constant plus a corrective term. Um, and so I start by, you know, just breaking down these parentheses into two parts and then I take notation. So uh, in that, in what follows, everything that has a bar over it is the empirical uh, average over the path, is the average value over the path right? uh, exposed. Um, and, uh, and so with that, uh, uh, so, so that's one notation. Um, Next, I'm going to decompose this you know, integral here. I'm going to do multiply it by t divided by t, uh, and, and also uh, du over du. So here, I, dividing by du is in the way of the random Nikodim uh, measure. Uh, and so, um, and the last thing I'll do is to note that for any function f and g, the kind of, you know, expected value of f times g is the average of f times the average of g times um, the variance of uh, a, b. So, you know, so I'm going to use the three like notations or tools uh, to make some progress on that uh, quantity. Um, so again, we have that, you know, gamma integral, I break it into two bits. The first bits I'm going to focus on here, integral of gamma star, the quadratic variation of s over s square, is again, I multiply and divide by T and by DU. Uh, and I use this kind of, you know, expectation of AB formula. So, you know, expect product, expectation of a product is product of expectations time plus covariance. So again, uh, product of expectation is here. Covariance is here expressed as correlation times standard deviation of A, standard deviation of B. Um, And so, and so, yeah, so this is where this uh, takes us. Uh, and so now I'm just going to take a few notations um, and, uh, you know, sigma r is now the realized uh, volatility between zero and t. So mathematically, this is defined as the quality variation of s over s square. Uh, and, um, and so then this becomes, you know, this quantity, you know, if, if, if I add everything together, that quantity um, becomes, uh, you know, this, which is again, the product of expectation plus the covariance term. Uh, and here I'm going to, um, you know, what I have to do now is just to note that you know, a square minus b square is a minus b, a plus b. And uh, it takes me here. And I'll finally, uh, you know, uh, cause the uh, volatility premium to appear in my equation. So sigma r minus sigma zero is the volatility premium as I defined it earlier. Um, and so that's, you know, that's, this is the gamma term uh, of the kind of uh, equation kind of broken down. Uh, so again, you know, the idea here is to say, well, your gamma term is you know, what it would be if gamma were constant plus a corrective term. Um, so now I'm left with, you know, if, yeah, I'm, so I've worked on the gamma term um, um, and the plus the vega term. Um, uh, what's really left for me is to clean up a little bit some residual uh, drift terms. So remember, this is the original formula, you know, with like the kind of row, uh, Greeks, Vega, Volga, Vana, plus that gamma plus Vega term here. Uh, this is the row kind of PNL formula. So this one has, it has two drift terms that I haven't worked on yet. And then from this Vega plus gamma term, I also kind of, you know, the kind of working on it resulting in two more drift terms appearing. So of two this in those uh, red rectangles, there's two plus two, four drift terms appearing. Uh, you know, I kind of spare you the details, it's a bit tedious, but so again, you know, we summon again that uh, Vega equals like, um, um, that basically like, you know, the, the, sorry, this is the wrong equation, but Vega, the, the Vega equal gamma equation, we differentiate differentiated on both sides and we uh, end up with uh, a kind of much shorter expression for those four drift terms. So those four drift terms here, just you'll have to trust me on this, 
uh, the sum of these four terms is equal to this here. So basically, um, this fancy like V is a Vega, Vega over Sigma minus Volga times the quadratic variation of Sigma. So thanks for bearing with me. If you haven't followed everything, uh, it's um, not a big deal. Uh, this is what we, uh, the end result uh, that we get here. So here is just the PNL of uh, a, um, uh, is the PNL of a delta hedge vanilla option over uh, zero to lower case T. Um, and, uh, you know, with um, um, not that many assumptions, um, as Peter really referred pointed out, uh, we assume no jumps, uh, and we also delta head using black So I would say these are the main two assumptions, but no, apart from that, no particular assumptions on the dynamic of the underlying. Um, so uh, this is the you know, formula uh, that we get. Um, and as mentioned earlier, we see here the link between the volatility premium and that uh, option PNL in a fairly explicit manner. Um, and so what I'm gonna do next, uh, what I'm gonna do next is just to uh, you know, look at each of them kind of in detail um, um, uh, in the special case of, uh, of FX uh, straddles. But just perhaps um, to make sure we're all on board on the notation. So that first uh, component is called the volatility premium. Again, it's something times uh, the uh, volatility premium. So again, gamma star is just a discounted dollar gamma. Gamma star bar is your realized average gamma over the path. Sigma r is the realized vol over the path. Um, so when you've held the option, sigma zero is the implied vol that you traded. Um, you know, probably suboptimal uh, notations here. Um, sigma r is realized vol. Sigma zero is implied vol at t equals zero. Um, this is the corrective term I mentioned to account for the fact that gamma star is not constant. Uh, rho is the correlation between gamma star and this, which is really like the realized variance. And then this is standard deviation of gamma star, standard deviation of realized variance. A third term, which is you know, more straightforward to understand, is really some discounted, some vol ratio times vega when you take the snapshot of the PNL, so you know vega at, uh, lower, at small t times the change in implied rule between the time when you trade it and the time when you're looking at the PNL. Um, so pretty straightforward term. Um, gamma uh, d gamma term. So this is you know something the integral of something times d gamma star. Um, gamma star has this property that under black shoal and um, under a number of sort of kind of more general assumptions uh, is a martingale. And therefore the expectation of this quantity on average uh, should be uh, you know, zero uh, when gamma star is a martingale, uh, right? So a term, you know, maybe that's not kind of, that doesn't tell us much, but uh, at least we know that uh, on average, it should be pretty small, uh, at least under those assumptions uh, in the risk neutral uh, measure. Uh, and then finally, this, you know, those residual terms uh, that look a bit like some sort of like convexity um, a, 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 on the vol dependency. Um, so this is the, uh, the equation and let's now uh, take a look um, uh, at what it looks like uh, in FX. Um, Let me interrupt here. There was a yeah. question. So, well, I actually have a small question first. Why is Gamma Star a Martingale? I missed that. Um, so I think the way to um, to prove it is just to look at the fame. If you look at the fame and CAC equation uh, that uh, the option price uh, satisfies, um, you know, basically, sorry, I'm, I'm actually a bit rusty, but the uh, the fame and CAC, the idea is that I think one of the ways to kind of tackle the, the whole kind of, you know, option pricing like 101 is just to notice that um, that the option price is a martingale. Uh, uh, um, but because it satisfies the Feynman CAC equation, and so it can you can express it as a function of its terminal value, like an expectation. Uh, but now, if you differentiate that equation twice, you don't get the price; you get the gamma, and it satisfies a similar equation. And you can as well write it as the expectation of its terminal value, and as therefore it becomes a martingale. So that's kind of 
So yeah. kind of I have it. a quicker proof. So, so I agree it is uh, quicker proof. Um, so uh, we all know the Black Scholes PDE. And um, if you say interest rates are zero, let me just for simplicity, then it says cash gamma times a half equals theta or equals um, maturity derivative. And then a maturity derivative is a martingale. So you're done. Like it's just quicker proof. You want me to say it again? So yeah, what is the maturity get... derivative? What's a maturity derivative? Sorry. Yeah. So I'm 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 proposing that under zero rates, we think of Black Scholes PD as one half cash gamma equals maturity derivative. Okay, okay. and a maturity derivative has to be a martingale because it's just the derivative with respect to a parameter of a martingale, which is the which is the the claim value. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Sure. Thank you to both of you for two different proofs. Okay. Um, okay. But anyway, the, the question the question that I jumped in front of was of these five terms, so which should we think is important? So obviously an expectation, you just convinced us that the fourth term, the D gamma term has expectation zero. But of the other ones, can you can can you give us some insight into which of these are large and which are small? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I was planning to go there now with some. Uh, actual oh, okay, numbers. okay. We can we can be patient then. Okay. Thank you for the question. <laughs> um, um, yeah. So what we've done is we've you know we've like built a back tester for FX options and we've um, tested it with FX straddles. So uh, in this specific case, we roll the straddles to expiry. So and we sell them. So we sell straddles, we hold them to expiry, and we delta hedge them uh and so uh we've done that and we've you know tried to see uh, again i mean as you, you, know, you kind of asked uh you know, what those numbers look like uh, in real life um on and on average right because we back tested over the past 13 years and so then we can actually take the average of those like uh terminal panel final panel so the first thing to do when we do this is to make sure that uh, I mean to take a look at the actual real PNL of those straddles, and to look at the kind of explained PNL, or in other words, you know, just look at the sum of this equation, and uh, you know, see how far it is from reality. Uh, one should expect differences for a number of reasons. One of them is that here I haven't included uh, interest rate dependencies, uh, and which will add some noise. And second, I haven't. Um, uh, what have I done? I, I'm, you know, this is assuming that you delta hedge continuously uh, in the back test. Uh, we are not, of course, uh, we are delta hedging uh, daily here. So there's a bit of a discretization that takes place and that will induce some difference. So, uh, so it's expected that it should be different. Uh, the good news is that they're not that far apart. Uh, so, so that's the first step, just looking at just not the components, but the total value of that equation. So now we'll just take a look at the first component, uh, the one that uh, we were looking for initially when we started this work, which is the volatility component. So again, I've kind of you know, uh, put it back here just for ease of presentation. That component is equal to the volatility, I mean, to something, you know, times the volatility premium itself. Uh, so obviously, like, you know, what we want to do is look at that something and understand what it is. Uh, so the first thing we can do is just to chart it, right, that quantity. And so it oscillates a lot. Why does it oscillate a lot? Well, it's because it's really a function of how far you expire from the money. The average gamma through the life of the option is, you know, to a large extent determined by how far away you strayed from the strike. Uh, and, you know, that's kind of correlated with where you end uh, at the life of the option. And so if you think about it this way, then it's normal that it oscillates because, you know, whether you end up near the strike or far from the strike is a bit of, it's really noise. Uh, is kind of, and so that explains the kind of general shape of that uh, quantity. Um, something that's uh, useful is that uh, empirically, we find that that number doesn't have a high correlation with the volatility premium itself. So this table here shows you across different option tenors and currency pairs, it shows you the average correlation between, you know, again, that quantity, that so-called volatility premium scaling factor and the quantity that it multiplies, i.e. the volatility premium itself. And so the average correlation is 4% uh, here. There's some amount of variation, but on average is not very large. And you know, we kind of confirm that in a different way later. But, uh, but so, you know, these are the two things we can say about this number. It's kind of you know, pretty noisy, oscillates quite fast. And also it's quite uncorrelated with the number that it multiplies. And uh, what does it mean when we think about it? Well, it means that 
that quantity here, that volatility premium component, um, behaves a bit like uh, a volatility swap, i.e., or in other words, just more simply, that you know, the, this number, this whole thing behaves as if the number was constant, you know, as a first order approximation, because it's a number that's independent from the volatility premium and that's quite noisy. So it means that you know this there's going to be some sort of like averaging effect that takes place when you keep selling straddles. You know, you're going to have all this noise here, uh, but because this noise multiplies something that has nothing to do with it, you, know, you get some sort of average that um, that takes place and that means that uh, you know this behaves as if that number were constant. Um, the, uh, so I hope that the heuristic makes sense. We'll kind of we'll kind of confirm it numerically later in terms of an actual PNL number. Uh, so that's kind of one takeaway, which is you know a we are now a relationship between the volume premium and the PNL, and b it looks like you know one takeaway is that every straddle has inside it something that looks a bit like a volatility swap, and so to us you know, bankers that's kind of useful because it means that you can or interest you know, kind of interesting because it means that you can you know, semi-replicate a vol swap through, through repetition of a straddle. It means that if you keep selling straddles, you get something that, you know, at least partially resembles a vol swap. Um, that's the first term. The, uh, and I'll come back to it a little bit more later uh, in a few minutes, but so the second term uh, is uh, the one we call gamma covariance effect. So I'm checking time. Gamma covariance effect. Um, here, I'm repeating it here um, to make it clear. So again, this was the covariance between gamma star and what really is, is really the, the realized variance. Um, that the first takeaway is that number can be significant. And so to illustrate it, I'm showing it on you know here. Um, what you're seeing on this chart is those first two components for the cell of um, Australian dollar one year straddles. Um, the reason I'm picking that example is because this is one of the questions we had earlier about volatility premium going one way and PNL going the other way. Well, we have the answer here, uh, you know, here is because of that gamma covariance effect. Um, in red, I'm showing you the contribution of the volatility premium component to the PNL of the cell of straddle. In gray is that gamma covariance effect. You can see that after 13 years, the PNL from the volatility premium component is negative, you know, which is consistent with the fact that volatility premium is um, negative for that pair. Uh, but the uh, gamma covariance effect saves the day. And as a result, if you take the sum of the two, you end up uh, in significant positive territory. So now you may look at this chart and think, well, it's all nice and well, but that thing only kicked in once in 2008. So, you know, what can really like conclude about this? Well, so if we look at some more like pedestrian quantity or currencies like the euro, uh, you know, or less jumpy currencies, um, then we have a you know, it's kind of a slightly different story or, or in terms of the kind of, we, we have a, a much more constant behavior. So here I'm plotting again, the cumulative PNL from that second component, the gamma covariance effect for four different tenors for the euro dollar. So one week option, one month option, six months option, one year option. And um, uh, and so, you know, here it looks a lot more like a drift and a lot less that some sort of like, you know, black swan scenario or kind of contributor. Um, and so that's one thing we see on this chart. The other one is that there seems to be some kind of, maybe it's random, but there seems to be some monotonicity between some, or in other words, there seems to be some, relationship between the maturity of the option and the sign or the uh, uh, magnitude of that effect. Short maturity option, you get penalized uh, when you sell uh, options. Longer dated options, you uh, get a boost from that component. And so that's something that we find for all currency pairs that we've looked at. Uh, so here, this table here shows you, um, you know, not the gamma covariance effect, but the correlation, um, which is a way to kind of like normalize things. Um, so here, this is the row uh, of the gamma covariance effect. So it's the correlation between the two terms between the gamma, should be gamma star here, the gamma and the uh, instantaneous realized variance. Uh, so it's um, there's a number of takeaways from this table. One is that it confirms that indeed maturity is a big driver. Um, if you look at all those numbers, they mostly depend on maturity, 
And the kind of corollary is that the underlying doesn't seem to play much of a role here. Uh, and so that's something for which we don't have yet the uh, kind of mathematical answer. Right? So at this stage, it's just an empirical observation, right? So there seems to be a strong monotonicity of the uh, impact of that second term. Uh, it doesn't seem to depend that much on uh, the underlying. Um, so for those of you who don't deal with FX every day, uh, you know, OZ dollar and uh, I don't know, dollar Swiss, they have nothing to do with each other. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of like kind of different kind of uh, typologies of underlying here, even though they're all FX, they like those things that don't have much in common really. So it's kind of striking to see the same numbers across the different underlying. So that's something, you know, that's like an open question for us at this stage. Um, so yeah, again, so it's the, that's you know where we can tell empirically from the start is that the tenor is the biggest driver uh, when it comes to that second component. Um, uh, we have one kind of thing we thought about, uh, but which we need to formalize, which is um, when you know when you think about that uh, covariance between gamma and realized variance. Um, you know maybe one way to understand it is through the Greeks. You know, you, you can make a shortcut. Say realized variance is a bit like real is a bit like implied variance. Implied variance is a bit like implied vol. Uh, now you have a relationship between gamma and implied vol. Well, you can just look at the uh, you know Greek a d gamma d vol. And d gamma d vol, it turns out uh, one thing that's perhaps useful here is that d gamma d vol that you know has inverted signs whether you look at the tails whether you look away from the money. On the other money, so there's two distinct behaviors, uh, and so we think that for short-dated options, which spend, uh, for which the underlying spend more more time away from the money, like shorter-dated, um, uh, over a shorter-dated horizon, uh, most underlyings will have thicker tails. You know, think about a tick, for example. If you look at something over, I don't know, like a split second, it's just going to be very jumpy, right? Whether wh whereas over a year, it's going to be more like a more like a bell-shaped curve. Well. That that kind of this behavior is there for most underlyings, uh, and so over a short dated interval, uh, things are more fat tailed than over a long dated interval, um, and so therefore maybe you pick up more of those like kind of positive signs here uh, for short dated options, whereas for long dated options you spend your life here, and that will explain it where you have two different uh, two opposite signs for those. But it's kind of you know, just heuristics at this point, no mathematical proof. Um, so, you know, I mean, talking about that, well, actually, we're going to have the numbers here. Um, the um, in, in this chart, uh, I'm just going to, uh, you know, put everything together, everything we've done. So you have the equation here at the bottom right hand corner. And here, the chart shows you each component of the equation, uh, you know, averaged over the past 13 years uh, and for four different uh, tenors. So we average over time, 13 years, and over currency pairs. Uh, and so there's one kind of thing you need to resolve for this kind of exercise is how to normalize things so you can actually like compare them and average them. Uh, in light of what we just saw, uh, we thought that a kind of canonical way to scale those, the PNL of the strategies was to divide by that, um, you know, volatility premium scaling factor by the leading term that multiplies the volatility premium. Um, and, uh, and so this is what you get when you do that. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention for that volatility premium scaling factor uh, is that when you stare at it a little bit more, uh, gamma star is a, is a martingale, kind of by and large, um, and, and that, therefore the expected value of gamma star is gamma star zero, right? So the bar here doesn't change anything. The expected value of gamma star bar at t equals zero is gamma star at t equals zero. Uh, and um, and as we saw earlier, um, Vega is equal to gamma star times sigma times times two maturity. And so therefore, taking a shortcut here, but this, the expected value of this, uh, you know, looks a bit like Vega at t equals zero. So it's kind of Vega uh, with some sort of like adjustment for the risk neutral versus physical measure. But at least under the risk neutral measure, this is Vega, expected value of this is Vega at t equal, at t equal zero times some vol ratio. Right, so this, uh, yeah, so this, the expected value of this is, you know, looks a bit like Vega at inception, which 
to us, again, is useful because it gives you an idea of how to size your trades. You know, again, it answers the question I had about, you know, 1% volatility premium versus 1 million, um, uh, 1 million uh, PNL target. Well, you just, the answer here now means is that Vega has to be 1 million divided by 1%, so 100 million. So this kind of observation allows us to answer the first question we had. Um, uh, and so, yes, yeah, I forgot to mention that. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, this is like, there's a number of takeaways from this chart. Uh, the first one is that the volatility pr premium component is the main driver on average. So the brown here is the volatility premium component. Uh, this is the main PNL driver. Uh, it's a bit subtle, but also if you look at this little minus sign here, a uh, little dash, that's the average volatility premium. So it's not, you know, this is just the kind of average implied minus average realized. And uh, what we can see from this chart is that it confirms that my story about this behaving like a vol swap, because when you divide by the average exposure, the average volatility premium scaling factor, well, the brown is pretty close to the average vol premium. So, you know, you're basically, once you scale it properly, the PNL from the volatility premium component is the volatility premium. And so that kind of, kind of confirms this kind of heuristics or intuition I had. We explained earlier that this is a bit of like the full vol swap component of your straddle. Uh, second takeaway is that the gray uh, is significant. Uh, and in fact, it's, you know, for like short dated option, like weekly option is very large. In fact, it completely, almost completely cancels your uh, volatility premium uh, contribution. Um, the Vega term is the red term. But conveniently, Vega term, if you hold an option to maturity, uh, Vega at maturity is zero, uh, even at the strike. Uh, Vega is zero, so you expect that if you do this kind of exercise, the red should be zero. Uh, it's not zero here because, because of some sort of like, you know, code architecture constraints. We had a few couple of days when we had to roll bef like a couple of days before expiry. So technically speaking, some of those options are not held until expiry. And even a couple of days is enough to create a fair amount of red here. So, uh, you know, kind of theoretically it should be zero. It would be zero if you actually hold to expiry. Turned that in our code, we couldn't do that exactly for every single currency, every single uh, period. Uh, but, you know, red is small. Uh, blue is small. Again, this is the light blue is small. That's the Martingale story about Gamma Star. That's the Gamma Star component. Uh, and then the residual drift term is uh, smaller as well. Um, and that's another term where we, we need to spend a bit more time to get a bit more like mathematical understanding of why it is more. Um, and so, um, so this is, uh, th these are the main um, takeaways from this. This is what things look like for Euro dollar. So in the market, we see a lot of people selling one month straddles on this kind of currencies. And this kind of chart kind of validates this approach because it says, well, if you sell one month straddle on Euro dollar, that's kind of the sweet spot because you don't have any noise from this like gray, that you get from the other maturities. And you know, you're like bang on your performance is exactly the volatility premium. So one month seems to be for your dollar seems to be a good way to actually capture the volatility premium. So that validates what we see in the market. Uh, another thing which uh, you know we see is that for uh, again going back to Aussie dollar, it shows that for some currency pairs, you're not uh, trading, you may think that you're trading volatility premium when you trade options. Uh, it turns out you're not. Like here, the gray. Um, quantity is dominant for Australian dollar. Uh, so, you know, this may come as a surprise to some uh, practitioners uh, um, you know, because you, some people, I think, have the assumption that this will be, uh, volatility premium will be the main driver. Well, here we should, that it's actually not at all um, uh, what's in the driving seat. Um, I'm mindful of time. Um, these are the so, main so takeaways. Can I, can I can I ask a jump? I'm sorry to interrupt. So no, no. so the gamma covariance term also depends upon rho. So is rho always positive, or how should I even think about? So rho is here. Will it vary for different currency pairs? Will it vary for different asset classes? So this is rho for this on this slide. This is rho for um, uh, FX uh, and then the various tenors. Um, I don't know if you can see it. Um, mm -hmm. So empirically, uh, it's mostly it's close to zero. No, it's not. Yeah. I think the takeaway here is that it does not depend much on the underlying. If you can look at the first row, for example, sorry, okay. just, um, 
the limits of my English accent. So the first, uh, you know, R O W here. Um, uh, so we see that on average it's minus 24 percent, and you don't see that much variation for across currency pairs. It's like whichever currency pair you look at, you know, that correlation row is um, uh, you know, kind of around that 24 percent number. For one year, it's all around 0.4 percent. I mean, there's some variation, but not that much. Uh, so what we see empirically, there seems to be a pretty strong pattern for that quantity, uh, i.e. it's fully, de it depends on tenor, not that much on the underlying. Uh, and um, yeah, that's a pattern that we, are, we haven't been able to fully elucidate mathematically at the moment. It's just, so that was really my question. Does it come out of the math or is it just empirically? No, that's empirical. This, okay. this is empirical over the past 13 years. Uh, and I was trying to say that, you know, maybe one avenue of like thinking to understand why this is the case, maybe through the relationship between gamma and vol, you know, rho is the correlation between gamma and realized variance. Uh, maybe looking at the mathematical relationship between gamma and implied vol would be a way to kind of get started on this, you know? Um, and so that's what I was trying to kind of, uh, yeah. Okay convey some intuition for here. Um, so definitely, I mean, for us, I the next thing to look at and that we kind of have a, a, on the back of our mind is trying to understand this pattern. Because once you do, we like, you know, say we find a formula to like calculate this expectation here, this row, like the expectation of row, then that will give us a clue as to, you know, what it will allow us to kind of predict our expectations for the gray area here, right? Which at this point, we don't really have but once we have, you know, if we can get a formula for row here, like for the expectation of row, then it gets us somewhere. And then we can have kind of an even better understanding of, you know, uh, yeah, the, those charts basically, and which is useful like trading you know, for investing uh, purpose among other things. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I would say, I mean, uh, if there are no other questions, yeah, maybe in terms of, uh, just for conclusion, like in terms of our avenues of research, the things that we think about is really yeah, trying to explain why, you know, this is the case here. Like, so getting, like trying to get, understand the math behind this. So calculate the expectation, expected value of row. Um, get a grip on that, a uh, handle on that uh, is one avenue uh, of research. Um, uh, you know, also like, it's kind of this is more of a technicality than an actual like research project but like here i'm assuming i'm using um log normal vol so you know i'm assuming that we have like uh, log normal implied vol available uh, for the rates market it trades with implied vol like with normal vol like because rates can go negative so you need to kind of like transcribe this formula uh, you know using a different quotation system so what if so i'm getting lost here but like yeah just you know to calculate the equivalent of that formula for like uh, for rates, for example, uh, but that's less of a, more like a, a kind of a small technical thing than a research um, topic. Um, and um, uh, also you can, you know, one avenue you can think about is, is there a way to actually find a delta hedging scheme which captures this? Or is this just something that you have to, you know, live with, you know, that gamma covariance effect? So that's another kind of question, for example. Like, um, so couldn't you um, form portfolios of options with the goal of having each portfolio isolate one of these five terms? Like, so, you know, yeah. so I'm saying yeah. th these five terms arise from a delta hedged option position where you're holding exactly one option. But if we start to hold in a portfolio, you know, two or more options at different strikes, then you know one could try to make the weights on those options be chosen so that at a point in time, like you know, I'm thinking you probably have to have five options in portfolio. Um, you know, the the only term that's remains is the one you're trying to isolate, the which is gamma covariance effect. So is is that what you, perhaps what you mean? 
yeah i guess that's a way yeah that's another way to rephrase it uh indeed um or i guess another way is just you know, like we assume here that we are delta hedging using black shore, not black shore, sorry, using uh, market you know, live market vol. Like we, sorry, we're using black shore delta throughout this, right? So we don't have a kind of necessarily assumptions on the underlying, but we, we make a choice on the delta that we use. We use black shore delta to hedge. Yeah, let's but... call that a language. <laughs> That's not a model in my way. In my yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's just the language you choose to use, which is perfectly fine <laughs> as a language. But it's also a choice in terms of the strategy, right? Like, I mean, we could just use any other delta to hedge, right? Um, well, yeah. So, I mean, once you fix what vol you're sticking in black shoals, at that moment, you fix the hedge. But, you know, if I, if I could, if you wanted to use the Heston model to create a delta hedge, I mean, I can still use black shoals language and find a vol to stick in that, that um, black shoals formula for delta to match the Heston delta, you know, for example, right? So, right, right, so it, right. Okay, so, you know, which, and the vol you're sticking in as you're doing your delta hedge, I believe it's the, is it the implied vol of that option? It's the is market vol, yeah, it's whatever implied vol, yeah, it's the black short implied oh, vol from the arbitrary time. market price. Yeah. yeah, so it's implied vol of that option at that time that you're doing the delta hedge. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. And like, let's say, I mean, I'm sure you're, being a practitioner, you know that like that's one approach that people use, but then that doesn't account for skew. And um, you know, people tilt it with Vega. So anyway, um, so I okay, so I see what you're saying. Yeah, like, you see, so like, yeah, so you have you know you still have one option as as opposed to what I was saying with an option with two or more. And um, but change ideally, you know, change the hedging, the delta hedging component. Ideally, so that the PL is just that gamma covariance effect. That's what you're trying to do. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I meant. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that sounds like it'd be hard. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but, but in contrast, I'll just say my thing with five options, you know, it's just doing linear algebra. So, you know, there's each option has this, but the, you know, the, the weights in these expressions are, are involved, depend on the stripe, like, you know, the gamma star, for example, depends on the stripe. So, so by having five strikes, you have five gamma stars. And so you can set it up so that. All right, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I That's the question, spirit of like... it. I mean, what all I'm doing is the same thing as people do to trade say vanna only or volga only or you know right. gamma only. Like, yeah <clears throat> same spirit i have another question like uh, can you provide uh more intuition onto, onto the gamma scope gamma covariance computation so you talked before that it was implied volatility then you say square returns how did you guys actually went on to for computing it ah so in the when we disc if you discretize this, uh, I mean, when you discretize this quantity, I think it's something like it's the squared return, really. Um, you know, so like, so, uh, so again, like the this gamma covariance effect is just your pathwise covariance between gamma star and that kind of animal here, which is, um, I think, which boils down to R square. It's just squared returns uh, when you discretize the equation. So the gamma covariance effect over a given period of time is just the observed correlation between yeah, gamma star and that, which just I think R square. Um, is that is that answering your your question? So mm -hmm. yeah, sure. Thanks. Does that covariance have to be of a particular sign? Uh, well, the sign is the term is dictated by. Um, uh, by rho, um, uh, the sign is dictated by the sign of. Sorry, I'm trying to. I don't want to make people see sick. I'm just trying to find uh, um, uh, the table here. The sign is determined by the is driven by the sign of the correlation number which we have here, and which, you know, again, seems to be like have some. I mean, is displaying some sort of like patterns empirically, but for which we don't have an actual like good mathematical grasp necessarily. 
mean, we know how to calculate it, but we just don't know why, like, we cannot explain mm -hmm. this, path this pattern mathematically. Are you, so, so most of the correlations, except for the first row, mm -hmm. a lot of the correlations seem like they're close to zero, right? Do you know, I mean, here, is it just sampling variation that they're not zero? Is it plausible that they're all close, that they're all really zero? Um, so I looked at the standard deviation. I think I have somewhere the standard deviation. I, I think just the, you know, the mere fact that they're all yeah, they're the, the same, same for different the same sign. Yeah, yeah, which see. are all very different. I like you know things like kind of gives me some hope that this is quite significant and not just mm -hmm. like okay. So other questions, if anyone has a question, feel free to unmute yourself and shout out your question. Well, uh, if no one has questions, I want to thank Olivia for a wonderful discussion. So we learned a lot about option returns. Those five components and things are complicated. Uh, and uh, we will rejoin in uh, two weeks, uh, December 1st. Uh, so David Hindendorfer will tell us about the uh, pricing kernel and uh, its implications and extracting it from option prices. So thank you everyone for joining. See you in two weeks. Thanks so much for having me.